Okay, so we're just going to be going back to this the general instructions, right? Um, just in case we never really heard any things. We're looking at music as it's in AC, this is, and we're generally looking to hear. Was this the part that we weren't hearing? This part on low? Was this part fine? Okay, this part's okay. Right, so we're generally just looking at our ribose sugar, not deoxyribose sugar. Right, the ribose tends to have hydroxyl groups on the first, second, third, and fifth carbons. While for deoxyribose, we're sharing that on the second carbon too. There's a deoxy, there's a removal, right, of the hydroxyl group on a ribose sugar. So that's what the two, two deoxyribose speaks to, right? When they form acids, they're going to have a ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid. Fair enough? Alright. So, the nitrogenous basis now. Right, what we're generally looking at is that the fact that we have these different nitrogenous derivatives. And when we have the nitrogenous bases, right, connecting to or ribose right or deoxyribose we're going to have the advent of different types of structures right so we're going to have the creation of what we call our nucleotides per se all right so we have uh, um different types of nucleotides right we have our pyrimidines right and we have our purines we know the pyrimidines to be the larger structures like um well the smaller structures actually like uracil, thymine, and cytosine, and our purines to be adenine and guanine, right? So this is just the information as it relates to that. And we're going to be looking at their bonding, right, and how their structures um, generally look. Okay, so if we look at the pyrimidine, the pyrimidine is actually a smaller derivative. We have uracil here, which um, is in RNA only, present in RNA only. Thymine, which is present within um, DNA only, and then we have for cytosine, which is present in both DNA and RNA, right? And then for purines, though, we're going to have adenine and guanine, right? So these are the pyrimidines and the purines specifically, right? We're going to be looking at which purine and which pyrimidine will actually have interactions with each other. Right, and how their hydrogen bonding is important as it, relate, as it relates to um, the function of the enzyme helicase, right, and looking at the entire um, replication, right. So the structure of the nucleotides, we know that we have a phosphate group attached to a sugar, right, our ribose, right, in this case, it is going to be what we have here, just a regular sugar derivative, right, and our nitrogen space, all right. Everything here should be fine so far. Right, so our pyrimidine nucleotides, right? We're looking at our pyrimidine nucleotides. Right, so in the case of our um, cytosine, right, we have this nucleotide derivative. We have our cytosine connected to our ribose, right here, connected to our phosphate. Right, so it's just looking at it. Everything here should be fine should be okay to look at right as it relates to the structure of the nucleotide our purine nucleotides now would have an overhang like this right a little bit more bulkier than the pu than the um pyrimidine nucleotides okay everything is fine so far So DNA structure now, right? Looking at just general DNA structure, the molecular view, right? So we know that when we're looking at our primary structure, though, the primary structure of DNA is interesting. We're gonna have the nucleotides linking together through the ester linkages between the phosphate groups, right, on one nucleotide and the hydroxyl group on the third carbon atom of the ribose or the sugar unit of another nucleotide. That's interesting rather interesting so what we're gonna have is a ester linkage right 
from the phosphate to dihydroxyl group right there and then we're going to have um an entire um linkage from the third carbon atom of the sugar unit right so we're looking at here i'm gonna look at it here in this case here if we look at the carbon atoms right carbon one two three four right there's gonna be an ester linkage here on the third carbon of the sugar unit combined to the phosphate group of the next nucleotide right so that's what we're seeing there the fifth carbon is here the fifth carbon is on the top of the chain the fifth carbon is what is attached to the phosphate group right up here on the side right so this is what we call the five prime end because we're looking at the fifth carbon up here and here the third carbon is pointed to the bottom so this is the three prime end so the dna sequence is red from five prime to three prime red from top to bottom that's what it's saying right and here we're showing the creation of the phosphodiester linkage right where we have two esters at the edges of the phosphate group right so we have the phosphodiester linkage there right so know that at the top we're gonna have the fifth carbon point you know and at the bottom we're gonna have the third carbon point so therefore we have a five prime to third prime um sequence right everything else here should be fine we'll just look at the primary structure okay with the secondary structure of DNA, you know, we're going to be looking at the helical structure. Now, we're looking at this now. And the picture on the slide would be of Rosalind Franklin, who was um, the scientist who looked at, who discovered the density, right, of the DNA molecule itself and look at the helical structure. She found it, right? So, the helical structure of DNA, famously described as the double helix, is a fundamental aspect of its organization and function, right? So the origin of its helical structure is attributed to the complementary base pairings between nucleotides and the specific arrangement of the sugar phosphate backbones, right? So we're going to be looking at that helical structure, right? First, complementary base, base pairing, right? So we should know how the bases pair specifically, right? So usually you're going to have a pyrimidine and a purine. It's always a pyrimidine and a purine bonding together in that case, right? So something like thymine and adenine, right, would actually bond together to create two hydrogen bonds, right? And then cytosine and guanine would bond together to create three hydrogen bonds, right? And a simple way that I used to remember that A goes to T and C goes to G I tend to just remember apple tree, car garage, right? So, an apple tree and a car is associated with a garage. Therefore, apple tree added into timing and car garage sighting into guanine, right? Just remember those, right? That's what I use. There are many ways to remember them. But it should be fine. Once you learn them, you tend not to forget them forever, right? It's one of those things, okay? So we're looking at it. So we know that the pyrimidine like thymine will bond to the, the purine like adenine, right? And we know a pyrimidine like cytosine will bond to a purine like guanine. So remember that when cytosine and guanine actually bond, it creates three hydrogen bonds, while when thymine and adenine bond, it creates two hydrogen bonds. And this creates a varying of a length specifically, right? We're going to be looking at how that works. Okay, so these complementary base pairs allows the two DNA strands to align in an anti-parallel fashion with the nitrogenous bases facing inwards, right? And we're going to have, um, well, they are going to form hydrogen bonds as we're talking about here. And this base pairing specificity ensures that each strand of DNA serves as a template for the synthesis of its complementary strand during DNA replication. So if one strand is always a complement of another, right, then during DNA replication, you can always use one as a template for the other. So it can self-replicate, right? So the sugar phosphate backbone, right, the arrangement, you know, 
generally know the arrangement. We're talking about how it is attached, right? How we create that backbone there, right? When we link um the carbons, right? Well, the phosphodiester bonds with phosphate, right? So it tends to create this entire backbone here. See this young figure B in the PowerPoint, right? They have this entire backbone going across the DNA structure there. All right, in figure B there. In figure A, it's just really showing, right, a sugar, a base, and a phosphate group. And we're looking at going from the five prime to the three prime direction. All right. And then in C, now what we're looking at is some things that can cause, right, what we call the helical structure. So when we look at timing and adding, right, we're having these different grooves here, especially for cytosine and guanine as well, right? And that will create varying lengths and cause the entire structure to twist. But we're not going to be looking at the advanced biochemistry behind the structure, but just to look at the pack that is helical, all right? So that should be fine. For the RNA structure now, ribonucleic acid, we know that there are made, there's a major difference. So with the RNA, we know that the base thymine has been really replaced with uracil right and then we know that RNA specifically only has one um, strand compared to the two strand more stable structure of DNA right so in this case we can look at DNA here and then RNA specifically so RNA would form these intricate complex structures as hydrogen bonds are broken and restored to create these large um coiled scenarios right as opposed to the uniquely structured helical um presence of dna rna would be in this um structure right with just one possible well with just one strand right so we have that there so notice that they have almost everything in common except for in RNA we replace timing with uracil. Everything there should be fine. Okay. So that's generally the structures. Are there any questions about the structures though? Any questions relating to the structures? No? Right. Looks like everything is fine as it relates to structures. Mm -hmm. All right.